designer Florence Knoll and pay tribute to the legacy of her design thinking. Uh, my name is Karen Rice. I am the Knoll Studio rep here in BC. I manage projects with Knoll Studio product uh, throughout the province, a variety of kinds of projects. And I'm so excited to be uh, hosting my colleague and friend. She's the director of sales for Knoll Studio in North America, Jennifer Roth. She phoned me on Saturday afternoon and said, because she's from Arizona, first of all, and she phoned me on Saturday and said, I hear Seattle's getting hit with snow. What's going on in Vancouver? And I literally looked outside and said, we have no snow here. We're fine. <laughs> okay, so it's my fault. I apologize. I jinxed the weather and got the snow. Uh, but no, thank you all for coming so much. Uh, this presentation today about Florence is a CEU uh, presentation, so for those that would like to register their design um, credentials with me after, I have a sign-in sheet here, uh, so please see me and then we'll get you credits for those that would like it. Uh, so, no further ado, I introduce Jennifer. How wonderful, everybody comes out in the snow. We don't do that in Arizona. If it snows, you see nobody, <laughs> including no birds, no animals, no nothing. Um, it's just a pleasure to be here today. 
um, Florence Knoll recently passed away. It was a very sad day indeed for all of our company. And um, we have a journalist here who had asked me what she was like when I met her. And I actually have never met her before. And it, it didn't really matter. I still cried and thought to myself, how could you know, her legacy live on? But it's really the lifeblood of the company. So when we talk about Florence Knoll and we pay homage to the person that she was, I mean, she's so deeply ingrained in what we do and in the design philosophy that the company is um, the pillars that our whole entire platform is set upon. It's really with so much respect that um, I, do this, I do this presentation. This um, Florence Knoll was born in 1917, so she was 101 when she passed. I very proudly say, I don't know if anyone saw the article in the New York Times, it was an entire page dedicated to Florence Knoll and her legacy of design. She was a very special person to New York, but she was a very special person to the entire industry of design and the entire industry of art. And as we walk through some of her projects, I think you'll start to realize that she paid so much attention to what it took to create something special. She paid so much respect and homage to those that she worked with and she always named all of her products after whomever designed them, which was something that was very unusual. And in her wake, she really had, was a beacon for so many women, so many artists, so many designers, so many modern thinkers. If you think about the time that she was alive and in, uh, um, in working, it was a time that was so different from what it is now. So this is, um, this is her as a very young woman. She was orphaned at the age of 12. Her father was a baker. He died when she was five. And then later, when she was 12, her mother passed away. Very luckily, she was left in the care of a guardian that cared about her a great deal. And the guardian realized that she really needed to go to boarding school. So they went out all through Michigan. She was from Saginaw, Michigan. They went out all through Michigan, all through the East Coast. They traveled to a couple different schools. Here she is later, sorry. <laughs> These are the slides I just added to the presentation, so here we go. So Florence Nolan, a number of different, um, different stages in her life. As a very young woman, as, an, as a student, when she married Hans Noll, as a pioneer with the planning unit in the left-hand corner, and then as a young woman, and then as an older designer. So when they set out to try and find a school, they needed to find something that was very special for her, or at least that's what her guardian wanted her to do. Um, I'm actually from Michigan, so I grew up in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, Birmingham, Michigan, and it was a stone's throw from Cranbrook, a really fantastic place we would go there in the summers and go swimming in the lakes and the ponds. I didn't know that much about it. I just knew that it was incredibly beautiful. So when I learned about Florence Nolan, I started working for the company. I've told Karen before, I almost felt like it was serendipity, like it was meant to be. Um, this is a 350-acre campus. And the CEU doesn't really go into Cranbrook and what it was, but I, please, I really need to tell you about it because it was a fantastic piece of property, it was George Booth who um, decided he wanted to start a newspaper in Detroit. And he thought, how in the world am I ever going to get writers and intellectuals to come and work for me in Detroit, Michigan? How am I going to get them to leave um, the other metropolises and come here? And he thought, you know, what if I built a really special school? What if I did something incredible for these people and they could raise their families in this beautiful environment? And he set about this piece of part, this parcel of land. He designed, or he helped design it with um, Elil Saarinen. And I don't know, for all of you that are designers, it's really wonderful to have a wonderful client. And I think George Booth really was that wonderful client. Um, when you get to Cranbrook in the top right hand corner, it was very hard to choose which images I should put in. But this is the roundabout in the top right hand corner. And you walk in and there's this Carl Millis sculpture with these beautiful, beautiful people angled out. 
and there's the colonnade behind it. That's the roundabout for the car, that you might bring a car. On the other side of those pillars is a huge reflecting pool, maybe 150 feet long. It's incredible. If you stand straight looking ahead, you would see the reflecting pool with other sculptures within it. If you turn to the left, you would see down the hill and up the hill to George Booth's home with all of the gardens in between. If you turn to the right, you would see all of the student housing, which was just spectacularly beautiful. The reason I mention that is simply because that's the principle upon which the school was built. It was all about beauty. It was all about creating something very special. And I often wonder if that was the, the principle upon which we built all of our schools, if our world would be a little bit different. So that helps give you a little bit of an idea of Cranbrook. In the bottom right-hand corner, this is just one very, very small example of some of the detail. And, um, the fences are built this way. The, there's just sculpture at every moment in time. So when she arrived at Kingswood, I think it felt, the Kingswood is the girls' school, Cranbrook is the boys' school. When she arrived at Kingswood, she felt perfectly at home and really as if it was a place that she, that she could stay and learn. When she was um, accepted into the school, she was age 14. And the woman who accepted her said, what would you like to do? What would you like to do here at this school? What, 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 what inspires you? And she said, I would really love to design a house. So she was 14 years old at that time. This is the house, which is part of the Cranbrook collection. They have it there. This is actually the house that she built when she was 14 years old. She learned how to use um, different uh, materials. She learned how to um, architecturally design something. And actually, there were two garage doors, one at the front of the garage and one at the back of the garage, because she didn't know how to, she hadn't learned how to drive yet and she didn't know how you would reverse. So she decided to make a roundabout. Um, but interestingly enough, she learned how to use a carpenter, her carpenter's shop, et cetera, et cetera. And part of this project was doing the interiors. So one of the teachers at the Cranbrook School was the weaver, that was the wife of Elil Sarnin, and taught her how to weave. And she really, learned so much to the point where it became a lifelong passion. And you'll see it in some of the later slides as far as what really drove her to not only design interiors and, and reinvent interior architecture, but also go to the extent that she went to to um, complement everything with incredible fabrics. So I love this quote. I'm sorry, sorry that I have to read it here. Um, this is when she graduated from Kingswood. And this is the photograph uh, that was published in the yearbook. And this is the quote from the yearbook. Florence's ambition to be an architect and an interior decorator someday. From all appearances, however, we think she should just stay home and be contented to be the most popular debutante of the season. Florence would decorate any party. And I just love that because it speaks to her really having a focus and knowing exactly what she wanted later in life. Um, while at Kingswood, her architectural um, ambitions attracted the attention of, of Elil Sarnin and his wife, Loha, who made her an adjunct member of the family and took her to Finland with them during the summers. So Elil Sarnin was the architect, architect in residence and worked for George Booth in designing the school and all constantly improving the school and incorporating art into everything that he did. When I, I sometimes I think about when they had dinner at their home, they had a couple students that were, they had a couple children that were part of this, or that were the Sarin family. They brought Florence Schust at the time, Florence Schust into their family. And I always think about them sitting around this table at dinner time, almost like maybe if you were with the Kennedys, what they might be talking about, all about politics. And I think about their dinner table, what it must have been all about design, all about architecture, all about artistry, all about fabrics. And that was really the family that ended up bringing her up quote, to a great extent as a, as a young woman. Um, so that was her boarding school days, high school days. But when she graduated, she became a, 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 a college student there in 1934, where she studied architecture under Elil Sarnin. So she officially became an architecture student. And I just beg everybody to 
maybe you weren't alive in 1934, but I hope that everybody can kind of like rewind to their grandmother or their grandfather or their great grandmother, maybe great 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 there, um, 1934. So it was an incredible accomplishment for a woman to have been in in architecture school at that time. Um, when she graduated from the from the Cranbrook School, you know what? I just want to tell you one more story about Cranbrook. Okay. So I went to go visit Cranbrook, and it happened to be during the student's thesis. And I, you walked all around, and I showed you those big colonnades. This is a great story to talk about the kind of school that Cranbrook was. There were these huge, like 15-foot canvas balls inside of this, the, where I showed you the big columns. There might be like eight of them and the wind would come whipping through there, and these balls would bounce all around. And I remember walking up, and, and the girl goes, oh, take a step back, because you might get hit by one of the balls. And it was her thesis. They were filming these balls, almost like a, pop, like a popcorn machine, with these balls going all over the place. And she was standing there waiting for her instructor to come through and give her her grade. And that was her assignment. I thought, oh my gosh. There was another assignment where there, along the long reflecting pool, there was a girl laying down with the camera like this. And on top of her was a long stretch of gauze. And the leaves from the fall would come and hit the top of the canvas. And she was photographing that. That was her assignment. And she was waiting for her instructor. There was another project where there was a long, hollow tube. And at one end, someone was standing there waiting to hear the word spoken by something else. And it was an auditory um, assignment. And they were waiting for their senior, uh, for their instructor to come through. It was all like a self-guided uh, programs with their instructor helping them along the way. But most certainly for very type A personality artists that want to make a difference. And it, I just can't, I can't even begin to describe how, how different it is than most conventional classroom settings. So when Florence graduated from that school where you could have graduated in painting, you could have graduated in architecture, you could have graduated in sculpture, um, et cetera, et cetera, she went on to London um, to work for a firm called uh, Architectural Association in London. But in 1939, she had to come home simply because uh, war was threatening. And she apprenticed in the office of Bauhaus refugees, such as Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer. Quite often, Cranbrook was considered sort of like the refuge of the, some of the Bauhaus intellectuals, simply because it was some place that embraced modern thinking, and it was a place that people were welcome to think differently. And then after she, after, after she came back, she went to Chicago to study with another Bauhaus master, Mies van der Rohe. And now it's the Illinois Institute of Technology. Later, she said that Mies, who became a friend as well as a teacher, had a profound effect on her design approach and the clarification of her design. I wish this, I wish this particular CEU talked a little bit more about Mies and about the absence of detailing and how prolific he was in removing the over-detailing that happens with architecture and, and making it so much less and by that, by that virtue making it so much more. Um, but I think he had an incredible effect on her. I'm going to go back there. One, one more thing about a lot of the Bauhaus um, people that came from the United States or came to the United States, they were simply running from the Nazis, they were running from being condemned as modern thinkers. They came to the United States. Walter Gropius ended up going onto the East Coast into much more established school. Mies van der Rohe went to the Illinois Institute of Technology. And if you think about it, in the 1930s and 40s, Chicago wasn't a whole wasn't really that much to it. And Mies van der Rohe was able to make an incredible impact on the landscape of Chicago simply because Chicago was in the building state. Illinois Institute of Technology was manufacturing all of these great architects, and there was plenty of projects in all directions. So that's one of the differences with the Mies Association with Florence Knoll, simply because there was so many projects and so much building happening 
at that time. She was supposed to have been one of his favorite students and luckily she lived not too far away from him and she would walk by his apartment and see him down in the coffee shop. And so she'd wait for him to come out of the coffee shop and then they'd walk to school together. And she said she really almost learned more walking back and forth from, from the school with her instructor than she did sitting in the classrooms. Sometimes I think about what it would have been like for her sitting in those classrooms. I don't know why I always go to Lucille Ball. I think of like, you know, Lucille Ball in those days and age, and that was pretty incredible that she was his protege. But she had a certain respect for design. She had an affinity for it as a young woman. And then remember, she went to a school and was raised by a family where it was all about design and it was all about doing something different and better and more modern. Um, at the end of the school year, she moved to New York to work for the firm of Harrison and Abramovitz. It was here that she met Hans Knoll. So this is Hans Knoll with her. He was a very handsome salesman, and he came in, and he was selling a chair, and she looked at it, and she said she thought the chair looked like some uh, crap. <laughs> And he thought, who are you? Like, who are you? Why are you, you know, it's a woman in the, in the architectural office. And they got to talking and he realized she really does know what she's talking about. And he thought, would you like to come work for me? And that's really where the Knoll Associates, Associates was born. What's interesting about the couple really was because he was the son of a German cabinet maker. And there's a lot of furniture companies out there that start with that same line. The son of a German cabinet maker. And he came to the United States to really make his fortune and to show his family back in, back in Germany that he could do it. And so he was out there peddling whatever his, his friends designs and they would make it. And when she came onto the scene, she was all business. She had no, no fear whatsoever about what she wanted and the kinds of designs that she wanted to represent. So in 1943, she went to work for Knoll, for, for Hans Knoll, finding an immediate need for space planning services and an overall design approach. So back in 1943, if you think about an architectural firm, there were architects, there, were, there was no such thing as an interior architect at the time. Of course the architects did the interior of the building, of course they did. But as far as interior architects, that was yet to be defined. And really, this is, the, this is the point at which she was able to say to Hans's customers, let us design the interior of your building. Let us design how people work. Let us marry up the architecture of the space with the function of the people within the space. And let these things all be part of the same thing. So with that said, she developed something called the Knoll Planning Unit. I like to think of it as like the first interior architecture firm ever. Um, and she established that the same year that she started to completely design the interiors of the, of the, of the customers that um, Hans was working with. In 1946, their firm became known as Knoll Associates. So the first showroom that they did was at 601 Madison Avenue, and that, right after she joined him. Um, Jens Rizm was a buddy of Hans Knoll's, and he had designed some of the chairs. So she had his pieces to work with in her collection, but she really wanted to design pieces of her own. They didn't have a whole lot of money, so she, and not only did they not have a whole lot of money, but they also were like conflicting with wartime materials. They didn't have a lot of materials really that you could go out and buy. There's all these concepts that are different to us now. Like, how, you know, how would you get hardwood? You couldn't because it was all going to the wartime effort. How would you get steel? You kind of can't because you're competing with the government for the wartime. So they had to be really inventive, not only about their economy with their money, but also with the kinds of materials that they used. So this is just one of the showroom examples that she um, invented, which was just using simply cord to divide space. I think it looks fabulous, but remember, we're talking like the 30s and 40s. So this was something that was so different for people to be able to see. Um, here, this is a Life Magazine article of them in 1951, and I just took the liberty of zooming in on here. It says, the attractive husband and wife team made a modern success 
of making modern furniture. What I find really interesting is that she had the the gentleman to kind of fulfill the man the man the salesman part of it, but really look at her hands on her hips, and that's really the, the business of the of the furniture of the knolls. So in 1947, she established Knoll Textiles to provide, as she said, a source for quality fabrics. When she went to upholster furniture that she was trying to put into a um, particular project, she found that like the tapestries of that era, or again, rewind maybe to your grandmother or your great grandmother's um, bed, or, uh, furniture, there wasn't much out there. There was like a, a cloth that you might use for transportation. Um, and seat covers and a train. There was tapestries, there were velvets, and that was kind of it. There weren't a whole lot of fabrics out there. So with her guile, as we say in, at Knoll, with her guile, with her cleverness, with her inventiveness, with her determination, she went out and she said to the uh, manufacturers that would make the cloth for men's suits, and she asked them to please start making fabric for her like yards and yards and bolts and bolts of fabric. So with that, she really launched what was now considered the contract furniture fabric industry. That was something that she particularly found um, important is the texture and the serviceability. So with the showroom, they moved it to Ma um, Madison Avenue in 1951. And she was faced with a big challenge, which is in New York, the glass offices that they used had very low ceilings and misplaced columns. So you'll see in this particular in this particular slide, you'll see that she invented a way to use this colored lower screen. It completely ignored the ceiling and it ended up dividing the space with the black metal frame with colored panels. So again, take yourself back and to see how inventive that had been. In the Chicago showroom, this is the Merchandise Mart. If anybody's ever been in the Merchandise Mart, it's like this monster building with ceilings a zillion feet high and nothing finished on the ceiling. So it was almost the exact opposite problem that she had, where she had to figure out how to create a ceiling without having a ceiling. So she dropped um, the, the, um, the framework down and then painted everything black and ended up spotting the furniture. And in comparison, San Francisco showroom was a nicer one to work with, with an old wooden, with an old wooden factory where she ended up using a timbered ceiling to create a beautiful, handsome texture and color. And this is also the San Francisco showroom where she painted the walls and ceiling white, except for the colored panels again, to create this very narrow space. And here's the elegant um, staircase that she designed. And this is my favorite, this is the Los Angeles showroom with a very long, narrow glass fronted storefront. So she was able to see into the space itself with all of the furniture pieces and it looked a little bit more on the retail side, but obviously creating a lot of interest for the ceiling and the arches. And here are the European showrooms. This is the Milan showroom. In the front of the space, you'll see this is a Harry Bertoia sculpture. And to the right, you'll see the way that she created this ceiling that kind of pioneered back and forth with different colored pieces to create just a beautiful entrance. So in designing the showrooms, Florence Knoll also redefined the executive office, which traditionally included a desk. It was shaped like an oblong box with a work table behind it. This arrangement took up quite a bit of space, so she reversed the plan. And as the diagram shows, she created desks that looked like tables and came in different shapes, round, oval, and boat-shaped. They could also be used comfortably for conferences. And this is really one of, I think, her most prolific designs. This is the Florence Knoll Oval 2481 table desk. It really became the industry standard. If you ever talk to anybody that worked at IBM, it's a really interesting story about these table desks because they weren't the most mo they were they weren't the most expensive they weren't the most anything they were the most coveted desks of the entire company and when you had finally made it at IBM you were given one of these desks to sit at 
um, some of the simple design details is that Florence Knoll never considered herself a furniture designer. She considered herself really filling in the gaps. Well, I needed to have something for this particular space, so I just designed it. That was her perspective on herself. She really never gave herself a whole lot of credit for the designs, almost in a very humble, humble way. Um, but there's one detail that I love to talk about with this particular table desk, and that is the edge detail. So in a table, you can have a fit, thick, fat edge detail, or you can have a very thin detail, but you still have to attach the base onto it. So one of the things that she designed was the Florence Knoll knife edge. So whether it was marble, whether it was wood, whether it was laminate, it didn't matter. But on the edge, she wanted it to be very, very thin, so it looked like a piece of paper. Even if it was a, even if it was a three quarter inch piece of stone, she wanted it always to be very, very thin on the edge. And some of the um, later pictures in the presentation, you'll have a sense of what that meant scale wise, but she had the most exacting eye. There's a really cute story about a gentleman by the name of Bob Longwell, who I did meet. Um, he was one of the employees hired by Hans and Florence Knoll. He said, when we made this thing, we had to call, haul it up New York in the um, Madison Avenue office. We had to haul it up five flights of stairs. We brought it up <laughs> and she would say to us, oh no, 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 that is not what, <laughs> that is not the dimension that I wanted for that. Change it to this, do this, do that. And he said, we had to take it all the way back to Pennsylvania, where our factory was, refine the details, take it back to New York, come all the way up the stairs and have another design review with Florence Knoll so that she could see it. And he said, we might do that five, six, seven times because what her mind wanted and what she saw were two different things. And he said, you know, she was the kind of a person where it didn't really matter that it was a man or a woman, it was the person in charge. She was designing the furniture and she knew what she wanted. And if that meant taking that darn table down and down the stairs 10 times, and that's what we had to do because she wanted it to look perfect. Um, one of the most important executive offices that she ever did was Hans Knoll's office. So it was small, it was only 12 by 12. And remember, this is their showroom. So they're launching this modern office company, which is supposed to be just a trend, but we know that it's not now uh, as we look back. And they wanted people to realize it doesn't have to be conventional anymore. The space should function based on what you need to do. This, this particular table for him needed to be a conference table as well as a desk. It doesn't have to be very traditional. Um, so it became a big tool for them to be able to bring customers in and to illustrate really how much it should, how much the design should follow what the person does. And then also you'll notice she brings in a couple different finishes, kind of a ruddy color of, of wood, etc. So remember, this is just the advent of us accepting something modern. Um, and this is from, I think, Look Magazine. She commissioned these screens done. This is done by a gentleman, Erwin Hauer. And the screen behind here, it's like a double layer. They're so beautiful. When we went back through the archives and we found Erwin Hauer, he was the Dean of Sculpture at Yale. We had lost sight of him in the company recently. They went back to him and they said these beautiful screens that you made with Florence Knoll for um, you know, projects in Mexico City and New York City and Hartford, Connecticut, et cetera, et cetera. Could you make some of those for us? So later in, later in uh, his career, he ended up redoing these screens for us um, in the Chicago showroom in the Merchandise Mart. One of the neat things about her was that she always went to find the very best that she could as far as design, and that happened to be um, Erwin Hauer for this particular project for Look Magazine just open blocks that divided the space that you could still see through. Oops. This is Gardner Cowles. He was the publisher of Look Magazine. And she designed his space to take advantage of the fact that he had this little balcony outside. There's a plan here. Um, this is some of this is representation of what she might do for a particular customer as part of the planning unit, but really placing the plants and the sculpture and the paintings, but really letting people know what, what their space was going to look like. 
And here, she had an unbelievable meticulous attention to detail and she placed every single interior object that she selected from furniture to art in the exact fabric that it would be or leather that it would be or wood that it would be. So if you look at this, you can see that all of these different carpets are different fibers, etc. But it gave the people that were building this space out the ability to say, oh, I get it. Okay, there's going to be plenty of room around my, my conference room. There's going to be a way for me to talk to my secretary. I'm going to be able to go out the back door of my office to be able to exit if I had to for a meeting or come in late it's, um, to a meeting, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really an interesting way to take this architectural plan that she had learned how to do as an architect and really deliver to a customer the ability to see what it was that they were going to get. So this is the advent of actually the interior design, not decorator, the interior design idea of trying to deliver people space that fits the function of what they're supposed to be doing. Fabrics, finishes, furniture, and accessories are all coordinated and all done to scale for the architectural space. So in this planning unit, when she was hired by Hans Knoll, the planning unit took advantage of taking a customer, putting them in a conference room, and allowing them to work with their models and figuring out how this was going to work. I really feel like, what's the movie, Tootsie with Dustin Hoffman, where all the desks are lined up in a row? And I, I kind of think back to Tootsie, and I think, you know, that was probably a purchasing agent. He had 50 people and he was going to make five rows of 10. And that was as much as the space planning went, right? It's like columns based on numbers, et cetera, et cetera. So Florence Knoll halted the progression of that. And she said, no, we might have 50 people that we need to fit into this particular space, but it should be designed in order for them to be able to function properly. It should be aesthetically and such that it represents the brand of the company and it should really speak to who you are. That was what the planning unit was. So really, if you think about it, it was the first interior design company ever, even though it was part of a part of a company of a furniture company itself. And here's the here's Look magazine. Wouldn't it be great to see that if it was an updated finishes, just as what was stylistic now? I just think that is so completely what you might see if you turn around and go go one of your friend's offices uh, later this evening. So this is the Rockefeller family offices. She did these in 1946. So this is a cute quote that she says. Um, she says that she always, well, um, sorry, the Rockefeller family office of 1946 in Rockefeller Center was one of Florence Knoll's earliest projects. She likes to say that she started at the top. So for the Rockefellers. This is an interesting project also, simply because she, they wanted more conventional materials, they wanted more conventional shapes, and she really had to mold what she was going to design for them um, in this space. It was a very non-traditional shape, but again, lent itself to the kind of work that the um, Nelson Rockefeller was doing. And he allowed her to change all these things in her office, but one thing he would not allow her to do, which was the inkwell on his desk. And it was plastic, and she hated it. So she thought to herself, "What am I going to do?" You know, obviously she's on the meticulous side, a little bit of a control freak. And there's this plastic piece that's got to sit on the top of the desk that she just didn't know what to do to do with it. So she called her friend, who happened to be Noguchi, and he designed a beautiful jewel cover for the plastic inkwell. And so you'll see that on his on his table desk there to the right. So it's a great story about her. Um, so Nelson Rockefeller's L-shaped desk was the first unconventional shaped desk. And by this time, she had redone Hans Knoll's office in the um, New York office. And now she upgraded him. Now her, her design aesthetic is becoming a little bit more confident. And you can see the ramifications of this much lighter table desk. It's larger. It's bigger, it really provides much more for conferencing, and yet it looks more executive than ever, even though it's thinner. Um, I think it's an excellent perspective to gain on how her design really evolved. Behind that is the Florence Knoll credenza, 
Um, this is probably one of my favorite designs of the entire company. It is low, it's a continental height. She would often make it um, uh, juxtapose against the desk at a 90 degree angle so that it would go beneath the desk. I remember when I first came to Noel and I interviewed and the guy sat at a round table desk with this credenza underneath and I thought, that's so strange. And as my 30 year career progressed, I realized what an incredible invention that she had created is a table that provided the same amount of space, but in a much unconventional way to allow to really propagate conferencing and designing and speaking. It's the design of the piece that would help someone do their job. Um, this is the CBS office, and I love this because the finishes are a little bit more contemporary to us in this day and age, and that's why I just love this um, image simply because it speaks to modern art, although it's really not that different than some of the other images from um, some of the other projects. But this is from the early 50s, and Florence Knoll was asked to design the executive offices of CBS's new building on West 52nd Street and she had to select and place every single object in the building. So the building had been done by Eero Sarnen and was known at the time as the Black Rock because of the very dark Vermont granite columns that articulated the facade. So she began to work on the interior. Or the interior had already been, uh, been worked on by someone else and when she was called in, the space really was so low that she really had to go to great lengths to change that and she ended up um, designing this space, I'm sorry, the ceiling with this domed ceiling and completely putting on the, on the diagonal the space itself. So if that doesn't speak of Mad Men, I don't know what does. It, what does. Um, so that's a, a you know, 25 foot office, and the unbelievable rectilinear, rectilinear styling, but you can see how well she really um, designed the space with the artwork. So then we fast forward to the Connecticut General. So this is a planning unit. It was an entire campus that they designed. And remember, everybody that's working with them are coming out of very uh, conventional, old-fashioned offices, everybody. Nobody has an office like this. This is the paving the way for modern interiors. So with that, she probably had to overcome a lot of obstacles some she could get past and some she couldn't, but maybe a ship model might stand in the way of her wanting to put a, a contemporary piece of art or sculpture there. And I felt like she always wanted to do what was right by the customer. And if it was a plastic uh, inkwell or if it was a ship, then she figured out a way to work it into the project. Um, the, the space that they were moving out of was considered colonial revival. And so we're very, very interesting. In the next slide, you get a chance to see these oval table that, or these oval conference tables that she designed so that people could commune in a conference table. So a much different shape. And if you look at these back panels, it's what we sell today, now with power through them, but absolutely pioneered the idea of a movable wall, of a, of a wall that wasn't permanent and wasn't fit by two, two by fours and, um, with um, paint over them. They were fabric walls that it were acoustic. And it's kind of interesting because as you look at the panel systems, it's almost a direct takeoff of this. Really, it is, so much so. And then this is the um, employee lounge area of Connecticut General. So you get an idea of how organized she was and she divided the spaces with these brightly colored panels. You know, we're starting to see the advent in the office systems furniture world of these floors and floors of furniture, and now everybody wants auxiliary space, ancillary space, space to sort of commune, space to have a really casual conversation, all these spaces where people want to get away and want to talk to one another in a less than conventional arena, and it's <laughs> exactly this. Exactly this from Connecticut General, done by Florence Knoll back in the day. So if we're going full circle in design. People are looking for really low-key areas to commune, and this was the employee lounge that she did. Um, 
twice a month, Florence Knoll met with the people from Connecticut General to work on this particular office. Um, they, urgent, they built the entire, um, the entire campus and it was completed in 1956. It was built on 280 acres in a rural setting on a lake um, with several buildings grouped around interior courtyards. The courtyards were designed by, Isa, um, by Isamu Naguchi. The park overlooked them from this large conference room. So in 1955, uh, the Connecticut General Project was ongoing. Hans Knoll was really the salesman who would go out and meet with these particular um, uh, companies and talk to them about doing the furniture. And then he would bring the project home and he would say to his wife, by the way, we've got a new campus project, it's five buildings and we really need to get going. So he was the salesman and she was the brains of the organization as far as um, manufacturing and design, et cetera. But when this project was going on in 1955, Hans Knoll was killed. Um, he was a little bit of a playboy. And in 1955, he was in Havana and he was killed in a car accident. Rumor has it the New York receptionist was in the car with him, so she was on to bigger and better things. When he passed on, his half of the company went to his son and she had to buy out his son in order to um, get the company completely in her own control again. So she always says she ended up having to pay for Noel twice. She built the company on her own fortune and then when he died, she had to buy it back and build it again. So really a woman, um, I think she, she really was the reason that Noel was Noel and Hans Knoll was uh, necessary um, to the beginning of the company. He was a man, he was the salesman, he had the contacts, um, he worked very hard alongside her. But once she established herself, I think it wasn't as necessary to have a man at the helm because she had been recognized as the person that ran the company, not the woman that ran the company, but the person that ran the company. Um, and I. I have the utmost respect for her for having gotten that reputation um, because she earned it. So through her work in Florida, this is the first National Bank of Miami, she met her second husband and really the love of her life, which was Harry Hood Bassett, and she married him in 1956. He had an incredible art collection. He was really a wonderful man. And when she was working on this project as the planning unit, she was the interior design um, component. She worked with Skidmore Owings and Merrill on the project themselves, the, the architecture of the project. And there's the cutest little man, his name is Fred Tharp, he lives in Atlanta now, and he introduced himself to, my, to me, he said, I worked on that project with Florence Noel, with Shu, he called her Shu. And I said, well, tell me about it, tell me about it. And he said, oh, she was really, because she wasn't only the interior designer of the project because of the Knoll Association, but she was also partially the client because of her relationship with, with uh, Bassett. So she became the client. He said, she was really hard to please. And once you completed a project with her, she, you would be considered, at Skidmore, you would be considered having given a degree from Shu Yu. So he said, I remember the day when we were walking through the project doing the punch list, and I turned to her and I said, Shu, do I have a degree from Shu Yu? And she looked at him right in the eye and she goes, my dear, you have a master's degree. And he was just like, you know, beaming ear to ear. He was the most adorable gentleman. He was just so proud that this master of architecture, master of design, recognized him and his contribution to this project that was integral in her life. Um, in addition, of course, to her corporate work, she was asked to do residential work. This is actually from, uh, this was the original uh, CEU that we were going to do, which was Modern Living. So um, this exhibition was in, uh, in Michigan, Exhibition for Modern Living, and it was in Detroit in 1949. And it cataloged basically, how could you live in a modern way in this time period? And it really, it really spoke to the fact that maybe you could have wood exposed in your chairs. Maybe you could have a fireplace 
And it even says that it could eventually turn into a TV. <laughs> um, but she really treated function and beauty as a single entity. And from the wood back floor to the washable plastic jute, leather, sailcloth, upholstery of the individual pieces, it really, the room was designed to withstand the daily impact of heavy use in the, in the life of a family. And it actually says, the fireplace was intended to be used out of season as a shelf for sitting for plants, objects, and perhaps a television. Looking forward. So trained by Elil Sarnan, Mies van der Rohe, Walter Gropius, Marcel Breuer, um, and colleague Eero Sarnan, Harry Bertoia, Ralph Robson, and others, Florence Knoll put these and other leading contemporary artists and designers to work for Knoll. This is a 1945 advertisement uh, for Ralph Rapson's armchair collection. So this is important to point out simply because she always gave credit to the designers that she worked with. And that was something that was complete departure from the furniture industry. She always wanted to ask them to bring their best and somehow she would take the best that they brought and she'd have them create something even more magnificent. And you can see that in so many of the pieces that she worked on with Irl Sarin and with Ralph Rapson, um, with Noguchi, with Calder, and especially with the fabrics and the graphics. So Herbert Matter was the graphic designer that she worked with. He had immigrated from Europe um, in 1936 and really was one of the pioneers to use photography, not drawing, but actual photography in, um, in advertising. And Matter was, did a good job of giving Noel the visual identity. So when we talk about her being meticulous about design, I don't think there was a boundary between interior design and design, right? Cranbrook and Kingswood spoke to design. It spoke to the way you live your life. It spoke to the way you, you uh, processed information, visually, auditory, all of these things. So with that said, she was probably quite meticulous about the kind of advertising that went out with her company. Um, he designed this particular K for her, which you saw in some of the earlier showrooms. And the close-up photography really lent um, people to seeing some of the fabrics that she had designed for her, for her furniture. I mean, if you go to design furniture and you don't have any fabric, what are you gonna do? So she made that, she made the change in that. And she wanted people to realize that she was a fabric designer as well. Um, she didn't take much credit for her own designs. This was something called the, the parallel bar, where if you can see, it's sort of a weird photo. It looks like the leg is bent. <laughs> I don't know why they put this photo in there. But you can see that there's two bars there. This was a piece that she had done for um, Connecticut General in conjunction with just trying to relate to the building's contemporary glass and steel architecture. So this is the um, parallel bar series that she designed. But really, her roots in furniture design came quite a bit from, as I said, Mies van der Rohe, Marcel Breuer, from some of these other greats that she worked with. So it's wonderful to talk about this chair. Number one, it's so beautiful. But number two, it speaks to the advent of modern thinking and the advent of modern architecture. So instead of building a building, Mies van der Rohe might build a building of steel. Instead of covering it up and making the curtain wall what's, what's beautiful, he would build the building so structurally, symmetry-wise, it was beautiful. They didn't have to cover anything up. It's the same principle to this particular chair. Instead of building the structure that you're going to sit upon and then putting a piece of wood or a piece of upholstery over it, all of those details are removed and the exact structure of the piece is kind of what you see and you think is beautiful. So the steel frame, the cross member, um, it's not, it's not part of the CEU, but I think what's interesting to hear about when she and Hans Knoll joined forces to create this company, they realized that they needed a furniture a manufacturing facility. And they looked all through New York, upstate New York, they really couldn't find uh, the right place. So they went to Pennsylvania where a lot of the Pennsylvania Dutch furniture men and that furniture craftsmen were. And that's where they ended up settling their factory and built their factory. So their headquarters were in New York City, but the factory itself was in East Greenville, Pennsylvania, surrounded by Pennsylvania Dutch 
craftsmen and furniture makers, cabinet makers, etc. So those were the people that came into this, came into the factory and started working for her. So when she would bring something like this to them to say, how are we gonna make this? It was really an integral part of what she did, figuring out how to take long metal rods of steel and making a chair that looks like this. So with computer-aided design, we give, we're given the ability to kind of fool around with how we want these curves and how we want these bends to work. But back in the day, that really wasn't possible. So they would take the steel. She was a huge proponent of stainless steel. So for those of you that aren't familiar with stainless steel versus polished chrome, it's hard to tell the difference. And um, if it's a really good chrome, it's hard to tell the difference by just looking at it. You have to feel it. But a stainless steel is a piece of steel that the impurities have been removed and you're able to polish it and it gets this beautiful, what we call butler finish. She loved this to be made out of stainless steel because stainless steel is a pure material, much like a gold ring. So if you have a gold ring, it gets scratched or it gets gouged. There really isn't a finish to go through. It's just polished. You can just go take it to your jeweler and get it polished again. And it's the same thing with the stainless steel. Polished chrome, on the other hand, you take steel and you dip it into a pretty a, a, a coating and it's actually a metal paint. A, a plating is a metal paint. So these pieces originally, there wasn't any stainless steel at the time when these Vandro designed these in 1929. Sometimes we present these to people and they're like, too contemporary for me. I think, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but when you know, when when you think about these pieces being made out of stainless steel, so she always wanted to upgrade everything to stainless steel. Um, and when she took this chair design, when she took it to me and said, "I want my furniture company, my manufacturing company in Pennsylvania to make these. I want to mass produce these." And Mies, this was, this was the World's Fair exhibition, Barcelona chair, the German pavilion in Spain. That was the chair in which the king and queen of Spain were able to sit upon. It was a throne. So she wants to take it and she wants to build it in a factory to mass produce. It's like, well, I don't, I, you know, I don't know. How are you going to do it? And so she had to go back to the factory to say, okay, how are you going to do this? Number one, it's not going to be out of chrome. It's going to be out of stainless steel. And number two, I need you guys to help me figure out how to make these cushions. When you see this being made in our factory, you wonder why. And they're, they're, they're not on the inexpensive side, but when you see them being made in the factory, you wonder why they're not more money. This is all handmade, tufted with um, these guys. <laughs> they're like Popeye with these arms like this. And they, they're sewing the buttons like this. It's the sweetest thing. But they have to be so strong to be able to do the steel and the upholstery. So um, I don't think that I have another picture of that. On the back side is belting leather. So there's a lot of different kinds of leather. Not everybody realizes when a hide comes off an animal, it's like 3 quarters of an inch is thick. So depending on how the manufacturer sl splices it, it might be your shoe. The bottom of your shoe, very, very thick with a lot of tensile strength. That's the leather that actually attaches the cushion onto the chair frame itself. And then there's the upholstery leather, which is the top grain of the leather, very smooth and supple, which allows you to do the button detail and the piping detail and the much more softer kind of a sit. So there's the dichotomy of those two different kinds of leather. And then the steel piece are obviously bars of steel. They're notched and then they're fit together, and then they're welded to such a great degree. They have to be perfectly welded so that then they can ground the weld down perfectly so that it never looks like it was more than one piece of steel. So when she went back to the factory and said, can we do this, all of these um, people that she has on staff were really used to figuring how, out how to make things. And she brought this back to Mies and he said, absolutely, absolutely, you have my permission to pr produce these pieces. So it was an incredible pat on the back to her and just affirmation that not only did she care about the design, she cared about him wanting her to make the design because it was so good and it was so well done that she could bring it to market in a way that he respected it. 
Um, these are the Pettit chairs, and this is an incredible collection of bent wood chairs where Don Pettit said, there's so much waste in bent wood chairs. I would love to be able to, de to design a chair where the wood was laid up on top of it and then steam bent around an upholstery shell. So this is another um, example of a product that he designed with her, with the factory uh, workers to be able to figure out how to best produce this. So that was kind of like the groundwork for how she ended up doing everything. Um, Dick Schultz uh, was another designer. So these are probably some of the most wonderful pieces in the entire line. And I'll just read you the quote that he says, you had to do everything yourself for shoe. You designed the furniture, you invented the way to make it, you designed the jigs and the tooling, and for a little while you were in charge of production until you got it going. And the various foremen and supervisors took over. Then you went something else. It was a fabulous education, he said, because it meant that what you designed had to be producible. So again, trying to make sure that all of the pieces that she brought into her product line were completely producible and giving these designers an invaluable experience. So this is probably my favorite story of all is the Harry Bertoya story. Um, they were in Cranbrook together. He was a teacher actually of painting because remember we talked a lot about the wartime effort he ended up becoming the, he was a sculptor, but he ended up becoming the dean of the painting studio simply because they couldn't get the wire rods. Um, it conflicted with wartime. So he really was a painter, but she knew him, or she really was a sculptor, but she knew him as a painter. Um, but so many of the designers that came out of the Cranbrook School, one was the Eames, Charles and Ray Eames. So Bertoya, when Eames graduated, he went out to the West Coast and with him went Bertoya. And he worked for quite a long time for, for Charles and Ray Eames on the West Coast. And then, according to Celia Bertoya, his daughter, he got really frustrated with the amount of credit that he was given on the designs of the, of the, of, uh, the company. And he quit, not doing it anymore, went home with four children. So she said, I remember my mom selling things like jewelry in order to pay their bills. And then my dad wasn't doing anything. And one day a letter came and it was from the Knowles. And it said, Harry, we are so delighted you've agreed to work for us. <laughs> and my dad looked at my mom and said, what did you do? So basically the mother went to the Knowles and said, hey, do you have a position that, you know, could Harry work for you? And they made, they sealed the deal without him knowing anything about it. <laughs> so she said, we packed everything we owned up into the station wagon and we drove across the country. When they got to Pennsylvania, the Knowles were so thrilled to have him because he was a master of design. And Florence Knoll knew there was no rushing Harry. She said, what do you want to do? He said, I'll design some chairs for you. She said, okay, do you want me to pay you now? Or do you want to design them for me? And then as they sell, you will have, you know, residual. And he said, no, 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 no. I want me to design them now for you. And I want them to become part of your collection. So she basically funded him with a barn and a big piece of property and a home. And here you see the barn where he's doing his sculpture. Um, he was really a beautiful person and a beautiful artist. He never considered the design or the artist piece, uh, the, um, the sculpture coming from him, he always considered them coming from a higher power. So he rarely signed his pieces. And um, Celia Bertoya said, you know, he really considered it inspired from above all of his pieces. So when Florence Knoll set him up in his own barn, he created these pieces, um, the diamond chair, the Bertoya uh, high back chair, and a couple of 420, the um, dining chair, bar stool, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see all the sculptures around him. I hope, I hope some of you are familiar with his sculptures because they're incredible. One of the things when I was researching to do the speech, um, I came across the money trees that he had done for the Miami um, bank. And she had him do eight money trees, which were almost like a little forest of golden trees in the in the middle of this bank, which are really incredible. 
he also had another um, project that I think speaks to his his ability, which was the MIT Chapel. And there's a round um, altar in the middle of the chapel, all brick, very old school looking, even though it was designed by Eero Sarn and, and very contemporary in the sculpting of the bricks, but it was bricks, MIT, very old school. And then in the middle of the chapel comes down this beautiful little tinkling, the most effervescent way. Oh, it's just so beautiful. So um, she asked him to design these pieces. One of my favorite stories, I was told by a, an old architect in Chicago, and he said, I remember, because he did the build, he did the sculptures in front of the Aeon building on Wolf Point in Chicago. And Wolf Point is this big peninsula that sticks out into the lake. He goes, I was there, and it was a beautiful day. No wind, no nothing. And the sculptures were like these long cylinders, almost like a cattail, with at the very top a larger cylinder. And they were in groups of nine or twelve, three by three, four um, by three, or four by four, or sixteen. And they were in the middle of these fountains. So he got up to the podium to receive his congratulations, and the crowd was all there. And he said, will you excuse me just for one minute, please? And he took his shoes off and he got into the fountain because it was a perfectly calm day. And he started playing the cattail because they were supposed to hit each other and make these beautiful chiming music. But because it was a perfectly calm day, which it never is in Chicago, especially at that, at that place, the wind was supposed to fill in that. The wind was supposed to have done that. So he got into the fountain and he walked all through the fountain and basically played a symphony of the cattails that he had created for this beautiful sculpture in front of the building. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of what kind of a beautiful person that he was. Um, and he designed these pieces very much like sculpture for Florence Knoll. She considered herself not a furniture designer, just filling in the pieces that needed to be done because these were the stars. She knew she had the stars by Errol Sarnen and Harry Bertoya. Um, if you ever get a chance, if Celia Bertoia ever comes, I want Karen to bring her, but if she ever comes, she's great. Like being raised by this kooky artist, man. She just, what great, great story. Great stories. Um, so Eero Sarnin and Florence Knoll, um, you know, he was somewhat kind of like a big brother to her. And they were really interested in developing a, a, some, a cleaning up the slum of legs. So that we, I kind of go back to when they were kids and they were at Cranbrook and they had this big dinner table and that was a big part of her life was being brought into this family. They had three, I think three children and um, underneath the dining table, it must have had a lot of legs underneath the table because he always talks about the slum of legs. You got two legs, you got two legs, you got two legs. The chairs all have four legs, the table has legs. There's all of these legs underneath the table. So his mission in designing these pieces was to remove the slum of legs and he wanted to create this somehow in plastic. So they worked together to try and create this, this um, beautiful pedestal, and actually the impetus for the design came from, if you uh, can think about a honey stirrer, where you go like this with the honey, and you see that beautiful shape. And again, I spoke to her really trying to bring out the most genius that she could out of the architects and designers that she worked with. So they tried to look, they tried to make this in plastic, they tried to make it in aluminum, and they simply couldn't. It wasn't strong enough to support the weight of the chair, much less the person. And then you even saw those tables with the big tops of marble. So they ended up going to a shipbuilder, believe it or not, to create an alloy for them to be able to put the to put that amount of weight onto the piece itself. And so that really ended up creating the ability to make these beautiful furniture pieces. And that's one of the most prolific designs I think that we have in, in the modern world, honestly. Sometimes when you see really, really futuristic, um, like, I don't know, men in black, you know, it's supposed to be super futuristic. It's all Arnie Jacobson and Eero Sarnin <laughs> from the 50s. It just makes me laugh so hard. Um, so this is just, uh, I think I brought. Oh, and I also wanted to speak to also when we talk about the marbles that would go on the tabletop, she was really meticulous about the stones. 
Never forget that she was meticulous about pretty much everything. So the way that the stones were brought out, if you were going to have this knife edge that we talked about, that's when you build a, when you make a kitchen and you're building up your countertop, it's much less expensive to build the edge up than it is to shave it down. When you shave it down, you lend yourself, um, you know, into the possibility that you could possibly break the stone when you get to that really knife knife edge. So it has to be so meticulously laid out in the slab. And then here you see the polishing machine. I think oh, we're going to bring that. I think upstairs there's a sarn table where you can get an idea of the knife edge. But here, don't they look like they're pieces of paper coming out of that machinery? And it really is by virtue of that edge detail. And she wanted to have the beauty of the stone. In her mind, she has calculated the beauty of the stone and, and um, the edge detail should not, like, you shouldn't have a mass. She's not looking for a headstone. She's looking for the beauty of that stone in, um, in the space. And then I put this slide in simply so you can get a good idea of a 96 inch marble table and the amount of mass that takes up in the space. So well done. Um, so between Harry Bertoya and, and uh, Eero Saarinen, she really had some fantastic imagery to use in her advertising. This is some of Herbert Matter's um, advertising that he did for her. Actually, the top middle was the most famous ad of all, and that was the chimney sweep. If anybody ever saw that? Um, that was her least favorite. She thought that it was undignified, but everybody else loved it. <laughs> so, um, really an incredible person as far as design, even when it came to the graphics of the company. So in 1959, she sold the company to Art Metal. She stayed on though as the president uh, for, about a, for about a year and then became the, stayed on as just the director of design but not as the president in, it, in itself. Um, she was finishing her CBS project. She had a couple other projects. She really didn't want to leave the company, but remember she's in, you know, just marrying the love of her life. Uh, Harry Hood Bassett, and so she really was ready for the next chapter in her life. Interestingly enough, though, um, she left the company in 1965, and then in 1972, the Louvre contacted her. The Louvre had never done an installation dedicated to a company ever before. So the Louvre contacted her and said they wanted to do an exhibition of the Knowles, of Knowles designs. So she attended as an honored guest accompanied by the French Minister of Culture. The exhibition, a retrospective of the firm's work, was designed by Massimo and Leila Vignelli. Visitors climbed through the grand care staircase and entered the exhibition through the N of the oversized three-dimensional letters that spelled Noel. And the Vignellis really became the interior, or the, um, the visual merchandisers of Noel after this. They changed the logo, they did the price list, they really took her to the next level beyond the Herbert Manor. So the Vignellis designed this um, exhibition. They created plastic cubes on casters to display the work of each of, the, of Noel's designers. All of the fans of modern furniture in Paris became known as Nolisties. Isn't what a compliment, right? What an incredible compliment. And then in 2003, I always get choked up when I see this picture. Um, she was given the National Medal of Arts, which is basically the highest honor of all in the United States to someone who paved the way for art in our country. And this I put in simply because this is Florence Knoll's sofa from way back when in such a modern, modern interior and how incredibly timeless the pieces that she designed were. And this is a slide. She was, I believe, in her late 80s when this picture was taken. Um, the, there's a funny story, not about this picture, but about a uh, video that she decided that she agreed to do for Noel, the company that um, after she had left. And they wanted to interview her, and she said she wanted to be interviewed in a red room chair in Cato fabric. This is velvet, but in Cato fabric. She wanted that. 
And so they had the videography, she knew what she wanted to say, she was ready. They came to Miami with the video crew, but the chair wasn't red, the chair was white. I don't, know, I don't know what the problem was with the fabric, but they didn't have the right fabric on the chair. And she looked at it and she said, no. And she closed the door on <laughs> the, like, the public relations guy. It's like, what just happened? She said, I said red room chair. It wasn't the red room chair. So they had to go back, um, did the chair in the right fabric. They came back and she, in the video, she has on this scarf and she has her eyeglasses and she's talking like this and once you see this presentation you have a little grasp of what her intellect was like you knew that she had it all in her mind exactly what the curve of the back of that chair was going to be how big her head was you know what up against the chair what the color was going to be what her neck kerchief what her glasses were going to look like like you realized that and if you know that, you can sort of pick out similar details in this particular photograph. So she has herself positioned right in front of her Ellsworth Kelly, beautiful um, painting. She was a big advocate or a big um, a collector of weather vanes, believe it or not. So she had this beautiful half of a weather vane behind the Irwin Hauer screen, speaking to dividing that space, but yet not dividing the space. She has the Harry Bertoia dandelion sculpture in front of her sofa. So it really speaks to exactly how she wanted herself to look in this particular <coughs> photograph. Um, my, my boss actually knew her very well. And just to the right, he said there was an Andy Warhol painting that um, was done for her. It was of a shoe. And remember, her nickname was Shoe. And it said, the caption was, shoes for shoe. So she really had an incredible art collection, not really because she loved it and she bought it, but because the artists meant something to her, the designers that she worked with meant something to her, and it was so obvious how genuine her interest was in not only propagating modern design, but helping them make something of themselves also. Um, in the spring 2004, she began work on an exhibition at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and it was called Florence Noel Bassett, Defining Modern, and they asked her to curate this space. Actually, I have a really funny story about this because my boss, um, who knew Shu rather well, helped her curate this space. So remember, when we looked at her plans, everything was very meticulous, and you can really see that here. Everything's pretty meticulous. The fabrics are all spelled out. Everything's drawn. She's got everything labeled, dimensions, et cetera, et cetera. Everything was laid out, and the space was only 300, um, 330 square feet, so it was really small, but she wanted it to be perfect. So um, my, mom, my boss was so funny. She goes, Florence Noel keeps calling me. I said, what is Florence no. She goes, well, she's going crazy. She wants the space to be just perfect. And I said, that's kind of who she is. You know, like that's, what the, that's the foundation of the entire company. So it's a really cute story. Um, here's the space itself. Three doors and a window. And she defined each of the three principal gallery walls with colored panels. So her archives were really an incredible um, gift that, that uh, she gave to Cranbrook. And um, I, think, I think they're all Cranbrook. I don't think she held on to any of them. So this is all part of this whole exhibit was going through her archives and trying to find out exactly what she should put in this. And she was very, very proud. Later in life, remember she had given up, given up the company. She was on to other things. She really didn't do any more design work. And so this was a really, really important point in her, in her career to end up I think giving herself credit for all that she had done and the way that she had paved the industry for all of us to really appreciate modern design. So her conference room tables, designs to the right, some of the interior designs, the, piece, the furniture pieces that she designed. And there it is, there she is. Florence Noel knew exactly what she wanted and how to get it from the very beginning. She took endless pains to ensure that the execution lived up to her concept. Whether it meant visiting the printing firm where the photo blow-ups were being produced or making a special visit to Philadelphia to check on the colors she had selected in the light of the gallery. 
clear and concise in both message and appearance, the exhibition demonstrated how elegantly she defined modern and how she continues to define modern at the Knoll Design Commitment to Workplace Furnishings today. There she is. So thank you, everybody.